This is an ABC podcast. Hello and welcome to The Health Report with me, Norman Swan. Today, new data on whether a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages works, why parents of newborns are refusing a life-saving injection for their babies, the next epidemic curve after COVID-19, and could wearable fitness trackers supplement the COVID Safe app by detecting outbreaks of COVID-19 before anyone realizes there's a problem? Fitness trackers like Fitbits measure activity and your heart rate, and one indication of your fitness is your resting heart rate, say when you wake up in the morning. The slower, the better. Anyway, the evidence is that your resting heart rate goes up when you have an upper respiratory infection. Dr. Jennifer Radin has studied this in relation to influenza-like illness. Dr. Radin is with the Scripps Research Group in Digital Medicine in California. My background is infectious disease epidemiology, and prior to working at Scripps, I had worked at the Centers for Disease Control doing flu surveillance, and I learned how surveillance data in the United States and many other countries is often delayed by several weeks. So I had the idea that potentially by looking at this large data set of Fitbit users, we could identify trends in users' data that could be predictive of influenza-like illness at the state level and in real time. We had a data set of 200,000 Fitbit users, and I identified weeks where these individuals had elevated resting heart rate compared to their individual average. And I found that the proportion of users each week who had this elevated abnormal Fitbit data was very predictive of influenza-like illness. So how much ahead of the regular tracking were you in terms of identifying influenza before people realized it was going on? We had a data set from 2016 through 2018, and we compared the rates for influenza-like illness using the Fitbit data compared to CDC data that had been collected during the same time period. And what we found is we could predict the activity for influenza-like illness about one to three weeks faster than the CDC. So what you were looking at was an uptick in resting heart rate. But did you also see a a reduction in physical activity because they were feeling lousy? We assume that when someone gets sick, their activity level also goes down. So if we have that data in the future, we think that will help improve our models even more. Okay, so how applicable is this to the novel coronavirus, to SARS-CoV-2, particularly in a country like Australia where we've got very, now we've got, thanks to lockdown, we've got very low levels of the virus in the community, but we are going to get clusters and you want to identify clusters as quickly as possible. How applicable do you think it is? I think it's very applicable. So our study was looking at influenza-like illness, which it's a case definition for any person with a fever, cough, and or sore throat. So these individuals may or may not have flu, they could have other viral respiratory infections, such as even coronavirus. So we think that we will find very similar changes in resting heart rates for coronavirus. And we actually recently launched a study in the United States called DETECT, where participants can download an app called My Data Helps and share their wearable device data from any wearable device that can connect to Google Fit or HealthKit. And we're hoping to replicate the findings that we did in the Lancet study and see if we can track people prospectively over time and also have them share any symptoms that they may develop or diagnostic tests that they might receive for flu or coronavirus so that we can link their wearable data to different infections. And what sort of density of wearables do you need in a community to pick up granular changes? In other words, if you had a suburb in Sydney or Melbourne where there might be a blow up? For our Lancet study, we had about, I think, four to 7,000 per state. So of course, the more people we get, the better we'll be able to refine our models and look at closer into geographic areas. The answer is the more people, the better, but we still can do quite a lot with several thousand. And are the companies allowed to give you that data? Yes, for our study detect, participants can consent to join our study through our research app and they can share their data from a wide range of wearable devices, so Fitbits, Apple Watches, 
pretty much any device that connects to Apple Health Kit or Google Fit. One in five Americans actually wears a fitness tracker or smartwatch. So it's a pretty large and growing population that we could potentially ask to join and be a citizen scientist to share their data to hopefully help us identify trends in viral infections. But it is a group of people who can afford to have a smartwatch or a Fitbit. And you know, the argument is that the second wave, if it comes, will be in more disadvantaged communities, both in the United States and Australia and other countries. So it's going to aggregate around wealthier suburbs, is it not? That's definitely a concern if there's a region where there's not as many people wearing the devices due to the cost. We might not have the same data coverage as other regions. Jennifer, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Dr. Jennifer Radin is with the Scripps Research Group in Digital Medicine in California. And you're listening to RN's Health Report with me, Norman Swan. This week, the National Cabinet meets to consider a plan to deal with a new epidemic curve, suicides and mental health issues arising from the pandemic and economic shutdown. Internationally recognised mathematical modelling by the University of Sydney has suggested 750 additional lives could be lost to suicide each year for the next five years, and one in four of these deaths will be in young people. The key to preventing youth suicide and suicide in general is recognising that it's very much a local phenomenon determined by local factors, especially in regional and rural Australia. Those factors include unemployment, failure to complete education and training, and loss of connection to the people and services around you. The modelling group has been working in regions of Australia for some years and already had the data which allowed them to make these predictions. Associate Professor Joanne Atkinson leads the team. So because unemployment, youth unemployment and social dislocation play out locally, we used detailed models that we had already developed for urban, regional and rural areas to see how bad things might get and what could be done to mitigate the full effects of the the mental health curve. So we ran two scenarios, a conservative scenario that assumes an unemployment rate of around 11% with youth unemployment reaching 24% and a 10% reduction in community connectedness, as well as a more pessimistic scenario that assumes the unemployment rate will reach as high as 15.9% with youth unemployment at almost 35%, which is not unrealistic in in some regions, and with a 20% reduction in social connectedness. So taking the North Coast New South Wales region as an example, under the more conservative scenario, this region is forecast to see an increase in suicide deaths by 23% over the next five years. And this could get as high as 53% increase in suicide deaths under the more pessimistic estimates of unemployment. And these forecasts point to the possibility that we could see more lives lost to suicide in this one region alone than we will see nationally from COVID-19. An increase in suicide deaths by 23% in the North Coast region equates to about 113 suicide deaths. If it goes to as high as 53% increase in suicide deaths, that's approximately 261 deaths in the region. And in addition to suicides, the modelling shows that hospitalisations and emergency department visits for self-harm could go up as much as 20%. The group of experts putting together the plan for the National Cabinet do not seem to be using this modelling, which could be a problem since it has shown that what looks like sensible and feel-good investments have the potential to make things worse. Associate Professor Joanne Atkinson again. Health systems have so many moving parts that figuring out the right balance and scale and timing of investments across the different parts of the mental health system can be extraordinarily difficult without the use of systems modelling methods. Without these methods, sometimes well-meaning investments in programs and initiatives can have very little impact or even unintended consequences when introduced into complex systems. And we saw an example of this in a systems model we'd built for Western New South Wales. Two evidence-based interventions being considered in the region were GP training to improve diagnosis and referral for mental illness and mental health education programs aimed at increasing health seeking. When we simulated their combined introduction in the region, it resulted in an unanticipated increase in self-harm hospitalisations and an increase in suicide deaths. Interrogation of the model to understand why revealed that this combination of initiatives would generate more mental health service demand than the service capacity in the region would be able to cope with. This increased the rate at which patients disengage from services because of increased wait times and dissatisfaction with the quality of care. 
and disengagement from mental health care, the mental health care system, increases the risk of suicide behaviour because people lose hope that the system can help them or experience further trauma from receiving inadequate care from an already stretched system. The modelling also shows what could flatten the curve, which includes increasing the growth of mental health GPs and other skilled professionals, having services resourced to be assertive in following up and reaching out to people at risk of suicide, as well as having comprehensive teams able to deal with social, the social as well as the psychological factors involved in what is a very complex problem. Professor Ian Hickey is co-director of Health and Policy at the Brain and Mind Centre, where the modelling group is based. Quite correctly, the Prime Minister has emphasised youth suicide as a personal priority for his government. And the Minister, Minister Hunt, has always said mental health is a priority for him personally. National planning and national infrastructure has never responded to match that degree of intent. And it's been true of Prime Minister Turnbull, of Prime Minister Gillard, of Prime Minister Howard. We've never seen the growth in the actual capacity of the health sector to deal with this scale of problem. And now we have the new challenge. Best case scenario, a 25% increase in suicides. Worst case scenario, a 50% increase in suicides post-COVID. The government's massive economic interventions, if they succeed, should help to reduce suicide risk, and modelling can monitor those factors, but the health response is also critical. Ian Hickey argues that just as the COVID-19 response relied on modelling, so should the response to a rise in suicides by going in right now with what the modelling shows could work at a local level and monitoring the effectiveness on an ongoing basis. The critics of this approach say the data aren't aren't available to do mental health modelling. That's despite the fact that when the COVID-19 pandemic started, we relied on modelling which had almost no data at all, apart from early reports from China and extrapolations from influenza planning. Ian Hickey and his colleagues, such as Professor Pat McGorry, argue that the data are available. A lot of wrong statements are made in mental health. One is frequently that we don't have the data, we can't track, we don't have surveillance. We do. We have emergency department presentations, we have self-harm data. Much of it is not made available in real time. What we've seen with COVID-19 is actually real-time data coordination. Government agencies having to share the data. This can only happen through Prime Minister and Cabinet. It can only happen through the National Cabinet. The data is there in state health, in MBS items, in Medicare items, in private health insurance, and at the local level. It is entirely possible to actually predict deaths by suicide, just like deaths from the virus, by modelling those factors we know will lead to deaths, particularly in young people. Their unemployment, their skills and education, their social dislocation, and the associated psychological distress. All of these have gone through the roof in the last six weeks. We now see the national anxiety figures. We see the youth unemployment figures. We've seen a doubling in the national unemployment figures. And we have records of the social dislocation that has happened in education, in training, in our societies. So we know the risk factors. You can model them just as accurately for suicides as you can for the virus replication and its effect. The social contagion is just able to be modelled in the same mathematical way as the virus replication and its spread. And the same way, what is available to us is social responses. We don't have a vaccine, we don't have a treatment for COVID-19, but effective social action has worked. In the same way, we have the opportunity for suicides to take effective social and health services action to prevent that disastrous outcome. Suicide is like the virus. It operates in clusters and in places. It's already much higher in rural and regional Australia, where rates of youth unemployment are much higher, where rates of school completion are lower, where rates of post-school education and training are lower. Suicides are already higher. It's got to reach the social programs, the educational programs, the health programs. You need to monitor in real time whether it works. Many people say we can't do it. What we've just demonstrated through our modelling is you can do it. You can be as informed about these interventions as we have all been about the social interventions to stop the spread of the virus. But there are still issues about getting enough mental health, skilled mental health clinicians fast enough to where they're needed. The Minister has just demonstrated his power to change our national system to actually purchase directly the specialist services from the private sector to work for public good. The same can be done in mental health. The minister can directly purchase from the private sector, from clinics, through the Medicare schedule, 
through private health insurance from the private hospital sector and clinic sector, the extra capability that the states do not currently have to respond to this crisis. The states do a great job through their public hospitals and through their emergency departments, but they're at the bottom of the cliff. They are the end point. The minister needs to directly purchase at the top of the cliff the extra specialist capacity to stop people falling to that degree. It wasn't done in the past. It's talked about for years. It's not coordinated. But the minister has just demonstrated when required for intensive care beds, for hospital beds, his potential to do it. And the national cabinet has also indicated its willingness. It only takes 12 months of economic disruption to have impacts for at least the next five years. And this modelling that we have done is entirely consistent with modelling done on the 2009 financial crisis, the 1997 Asian financial crisis, the Great Depression. These are predictable outcomes of economic recessions. They're not like wars. They're not like other issues where people pull together. Recessions kill the marginal. They kill the vulnerable. And in these situations, they kill the young. The great advantage of the development of new modern technology-based services is if you're a young man sitting in rural Australia who needs to be in contact with real skill now, you've got two choices. Try and find a GP, try and find a clinic, travel, maybe go, maybe don't go, endlessly don't get help. Through technology, you can now connect directly with skilled professionals. You can also commence your own online treatments. You can also get supportive care through other health professionals. We can completely reverse the way that we've done healthcare to be in your home tomorrow with effective skilled care. What we've not done is financed it or incentivized health providers to act that way. We now have a workforce, psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health nurses who want to work that way and be in the lounge room of a young man in rural Australia who's thinking about suicide and dealing with him, supporting him, getting him off that pathway now, immediately. Not next week, not in three weeks' time, not on a waiting list for eight weeks to get any help. Professor Ian Hickey of the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney. On ABC Television 7.30 last Wednesday, the Minister for Health, Greg Hunt, seemed sympathetic to many of these suggestions. We invited Christine Morgan, the CEO of the National Mental Health Commission, onto the Health Report to respond. Christine is putting together the plan going to the National Cabinet this week, but was unable to come on today. We hope to talk to her next week after the plan is submitted this Friday. Let's move away from COVID-19. Many public health experts, including in Australia, argue that a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages would reduce consumption and therefore potentially lower the risks of diabetes and obesity. One of the first countries to introduce a sugar tax on soft drinks was Mexico in 2014. They just added one peso, or around half a US cent per litre. An evaluation of consumption has been published, and one of the authors was Dr. Luz Sanchez Romero of Mexico's National Institute of Public Health. Previously, all the studies that we have done were based on changes in sales at a household level. We found that there was actually a reduction in the purchase of sugar student beverages. It increased also a little bit more the purchase of plain water, and it impacted more the purchases at a low socioeconomic level. So people were more sensitive to even a very small price rise. Yes, but it's also the people at a lower socioeconomic level, the ones that have a higher consumption. In other words, the people you want to target who are more prone mm-hmm. to diabetes and obesity. Okay, this was actually looking at people themselves. Yes, now this study was directly into the consumption of the individual. We used data from a cohort that had information before the implementation of the taxation and three years after the tax was implemented. Before and after study. Mm -hmm. What did you find? The main idea for the study was to see if there was a change in consumption. So what we found was that after the taxation, the probability of an individual to being a higher consumer or to increase their consumption, it reduced. Can you quantify that? The probability of becoming a higher consumer decreased by around seven percentage points, and the probability of you becoming a lower consumer increased around eight percentage points. So that doesn't sound a lot, but it's not terribly surprising given it was only half a cent a litre. Why hasn't Mexico increased to a much more significant increase, like say 10% per litre? 
One of the main issues is also that we need to have more scientific evidence to see if the taxation could be a measure that promotes the reduction in consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. And although it's difficult to actually quantify or to prove causality because the tax is not an intervention on its own, there could be like media, education or other things there's always difficult on how you obtain the evidence. And that also compared with other political issues that sometimes happen. So you found trends that it was going in the right direction. It's obviously there's a lot of political cost to putting on a sugar tax. You get the sugar mm-hmm. industry, the soft drinks industry, people who think you're going to be the nanny state and intervening what, <laughs> rather than allowing people to make their own decisions. There's an enormous community debate. So you've shown a trend. You were one of the first in this area with sugar sweetened beverages. When you look internationally at other experience, which I'm sure you have, what's the overall message with sugar tax at the moment? I think now, since a lot of the evidence from Mexico and other countries about purchases and sales, also a lot of countries have started promoting the implementation of the taxation or even actually implementing it. And I think showing besides that evidence of consumption at an individual level really helps them. And as you say, it's a targeted population, so it's hitting those who would benefit most from shifting to lower calorie drinks. Although we cannot generalize that obesity is going to reduce, it actually is going to be contributing to that into the future. And in Mexico itself, how popular is this? Is there pressure to remove it? What's the debate? Now, the latest news was that there was some people lobbying against the taxation and trying to remove it. So we're just trying to create the evidence to support, not remove it, but also keep pushing to increase it to a 20%, which is what the evidence said that it's ideal, that will reduce the consumption even more. And also besides that, recently in Mexico, they implemented front of pack labeling also as a complementary intervention to help reduce consumption of healthy beverages and foods. Luz, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Dr. Luz Sanchez Romero of Mexico's National Institute of Public Health. Vitamin K deficiency bleeding is a potentially fatal condition in babies and it's preventable with the vitamin K injection at birth. But a 24-year long study of the condition in Australia has found that an increasing number of parents are refusing to let their baby have the needle and it's higher among parents choosing home birthing. Professor Elizabeth Elliott founded and is still director of the Australian Paediatric Surveillance Unit, which monitors about 70 rare problems in childhood, one of which is vitamin K deficiency. But her real claim to fame is that she was once my resident when we were both paediatricians in training. Welcome back to The Health Report, Liz. Thanks, Norman. Let's just start off piste for a moment. Um, are you monitoring Kawasaki disease in kids with the COVID-19 pandemic, given the reports Look, we, from Britain? We, we have done in the past through the Australian Paediatric Surveillance Unit. We've now started a new surveillance system, the Paediatric Active Enhanced Disease Surveillance System, which is an inpatient hospital system. And indeed, we are monitoring Kawasaki disease, which is very timely in relation to the covid uh, pandemic. And for those who don't know what we're talking about, this is this inflammatory disease that um, that children seem to be getting reports from Britain and the United States and Europe. Have we have you seen any uptick at all? I mean, we've had very few cases in hospital, but have you seen any uptick at all in Australia? Uh, not that I'm aware of at this stage, but of course, everyone's looking out for it. Tell me about this vitamin K story. What what? Why is vitamin K so important at birth? Well, look, vitamin K is very important because it is needed to manufacture clotting factors, which in turn stop us from bleeding. Now, we get vitamin K through our diet or through our good bacteria in the gut, which manufacture it, or through taking multivitamins. But babies don't eat and don't take vitamin pills, and very little vitamin K is passed either across the placenta from mother or in breast milk. And hence, if they don't get vitamin K at birth, they're vulnerable to bleeding. How far? I mean, to, to what extent? Is, is every baby vitamin D, D deficient or is it just a relative Well, thing? pretty well, yes. And so it's estimated that about 2% of all babies might develop classic uh, vitamin K de- deficiency bleeding. So that's a large number of babies. And this has been known for decades, of course. And uh, vitamin K has been used routinely at birth since the 1960s. And what happens in vitamin K deficiency bleeding? Where do they bleed? 
Right, they can bleed almost anywhere. So often from the gut, uh, the nose, the umbilicus, after a circumcision, after the heel prick tests that they have to look for um, congenital uh, diseases. Uh, but most worryingly, they may bleed into the brain and, and develop seizures or have a stroke or indeed die. What did you find when you did this 24-year follow, follow-up of the surveillance unit? Well, look, we found, as expected, that this is a very rare disorder, but that it does occur and that there may be deaths. So in, in this long period, um, we identified um, that about 10% of the children that we found died, and they all died from this bleeding into the gut. Um, we found 58 cases in the 24-year period, which is less than two per year. And what we did find was that they corresponded to changes in our national health policy regarding the administration of vitamin K. Meaning? There's a, sorry, there's a bit of a backstory here in that um, we were all using IM vitamin K. And in 1992, there was a public, published paper which suggested that there might be an association between intramuscular vitamin K given at birth and later childhood cancer. And so our recommendations, government recommendations, were that we change from intramuscular to oral vitamin K, and that resulted in a spike in cases. Even though there was no, no relationship? Absolutely. Later, the link between vitamin K and cancer was totally disproven, and we reverted to the IM policy and now we see virtually no vitamin k unless it's either not given or given in the wrong dose and w w how did you detect the fact that some parents are starting to refuse the, the injection well, for the well, baby that was one of the questions that we asked on our questionnaire so pediatricians each month are asked to report cases to us and then if they report a case there are some questions and we were asked we asked why didn't the child receive vitamin k and parents say that they, they often feel it's unnecessary or it might be painful, it might not fit with their alternative lifestyle. They're still, some of them, frightened about um, cancer. And we certainly found certainly certain associations between the parents who refused and those who didn't. And you noticed a link with home birthing? Yeah, there was a link with home birthing. So, um, And this is substantiated in the literature that um, at home births, children are less likely to get their vitamin K than in hospital. Midwives are less likely to give uh, vitamin K than doctors. And certainly there's a sort of geographic distribution of the parents who refuse vitamin K, and that aligns, interestingly, with the parents who refuse immunisation. Right, so wealthier suburbs, North Coast, New South Wales, things like that. Yeah, North Coast, New South Wales, South East Queensland. Um, so, and you, you can also get liver disease as well. Well, the, there are several different types of vitamin K deficiency bleeding, those that occur within the first 24 hours, within the first week and beyond the first week. And those children who get vitamin K deficiency bleeding beyond the first week of life are more likely to have an underlying liver disease than those who get it earlier. Oh, so it's secondary to the liver disease. It, exactly, so, yes. the, so the bottom line here is it really is prudent to get this and it's safe. It, it is safe. And in fact, in 2019, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared this a public health priority because so many people were refusing. Um, so they really want to educate people that, one, it's very safe, and two, it will entirely present, prevent, um, if given correctly, uh, this what could be catastrophic bleeding. Liz, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks, Norman. Professor Elizabeth Elliott is Professor of Paediatrics at the University of Sydney and directs the Australian Paediatric Surveillance Unit. This has been The Health Report. I'm Norman Swan. See you next week. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. 